morning. I'm Anna Nuzzo. If you see my name, it's N-U-Z-Z-O. It's not nutso. <laughs> Although, Wednesday was my birthday, and we celebrated, so I was a little nutso on Wednesday on the Feast of Our Lady Help of Christians, but it's Nuzzo. Um, I'm overwhelmed by the beauty of this church and um, the amount of people that are coming for us while we're here in Australia. I live um, just about an hour north of Chicago in the U.S., and Father Chris, uh, originally from Detroit, obviously lives at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy now as Provincial Superior. So I'm um, like the warm-up for now, uh, and what I'd love to do is sing three of my favorite songs. I have six albums. I'll share a little bit about my testimony after this opening song so you know what Our Lady has done in my life, specifically consecration. Consecrating to the Blessed Mother changed my life uh, 11 years ago. So, but I'd like to begin, first of all, with a, one of my peppier songs. Most of my songs are prayer songs, very meditative, um, perfect for mass, adoration, and just driving around in your car so you don't have road rage. <laughs> That's what I hear. Everyone's like, I have no more road rage. I'm so peaceful. I let everyone just go by. Um, I think that that's great. So this song is called Be Love. It's on my first album, which is called Be Love. And I hope this helps you sort of just open your minds and your hearts and prepare for the amazing day you'll have with Father Chris Alar. You are so blessed. Um, uh, and I am so excited to see him too. It's been a little while. So this is the song, Be Love, and what I'm doing is I'll be singing with my musical track just for now, but it, during the day, I'll then be moved up there to the balcony where there's a keyboard because I do play and sing all my songs. But I thought, I wanted to see you. I wanted to see all of you and not just be like a, an ethereal voice from the sky. And um, I, I'd look forward to meeting all of you during breaks and afterwards as well. So this is the song, Be Love. Are we all set? <laughs> Everything okay? Okay, well, while, while we're waiting, um, I'll share a little bit of my testimony. In 2012, I was asked to do the Marian Consecration book study program at my church, and it's called 33 Days to Morning Glory. The Marian Fathers wrote this book, and I didn't even know what Marian Consecration was. So when I said, well, what is that? And, and they said, it's when you give everything to Our Lady so she presents it to Jesus. All of your prayers, all of your desires, all of your, um, your gifts and your talents, your sorrows. And I said, of course, you know, why wouldn't I want to do that? I didn't know that it was going to completely change my life. So after the first class, I came home and I was drawn to my piano I'm a self-taught pianist, never studied, self-taught pianist, drawn to my piano to write a song based on this beautiful Marian consecration prayer that we just learned that day. I'd never written music before, so I'm 40, 40 years old, never written music, but I've sung for weddings and funerals and cantered for mass. So I put the, the prayer in front of me at the piano and I pray for the Holy Spirit to come, pray for Our Lady to come and help me turn this prayer into a beautiful song. And within, within 45 minutes, the song was done and I was left 
crying tears of joy, tears of wonder, tears of shock and amazement. And I felt so much peace and love in my heart from Our Lady. Never felt that before. So I knew it was of God. And I later learned that's called the gift of tears. It's the gift of tears and it, it heals you and it's like everything that you're holding on to just sort of comes out as you, as you leak, as you just leak gently. Um, so after I wrote that song, I, I called my, one of my best friends and I told her and she was at the class with us and I'm crying and I'm like, Margie. And she goes, Anna, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, nothing. <laughs> I just wrote a song. And she's like, oh, Anna. Oh my gosh. So I tell her and she's like, this is it. You're meant to write prayer songs. This is of Our Lady, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know, but this is what happened today. She was right. Every day, songs started pouring out of me. I'm at the piano. I'm writing the Memorare, the Our Father, the Divine Mercy, Guardian Angel Prayer, St. Michael the Archangel, Hail Holy Queen, um, on and on and on. So the first song I wrote is the Marian Consecration song, and I'm going to be doing that for you today. Um, are we okay up there? Yes? Can we just do the Marian Consecration song now since I just introed that one? First song that I wrote, this is exactly as I wrote it that day in October of 2012. Can you turn it up, please? Mary, I entrust myself totally to you. Can you turn it up? My body, my soul, my goods, and even the value of my good actions. Mary, I give you Set it on fire with love for Jesus, with love for Jesus, with love for Jesus. Mary, please make of me of all I am.
love for Jesus, with love for Jesus, with love for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what happened after I started writing music is friends encouraged me to create a CD. I said, really, you think people will want to hear these, these songs? And they said, yes. So my husband and I uh, invested and created a CD and it, it, it did really well. And after that, um, I did, ended up doing six CDs in six years, which is pretty, pretty impressive. And you know, uh, things like that don't happen without Our Lady, right? Um, she opens doors. And if the door is closed, she opens windows. Um, so I began getting called to go out and sing for conferences, retreats, missions. And what I didn't tell you is before my Marian consecration, I was very, very anxious, nervous, filled with anxiety about singing. So I would sing for, for mass, but, but I was wrought with anxiety to the point where I, at the last minute, I would wanna leave and, and tell myself, you're not good enough. What are you doing here? You're, vo you know, you're, not, that, you're not that good. Um, there's people that can do it better and everyone's gonna be staring at you. So all these little negative voices were going through my head and I know many of you can relate to that. I'm not good enough. And I, I later learned you know, through Our Lady that that's the evil one. And of course he doesn't want any of us to build the kingdom of God. And Our Lady is one of the most powerful ways to defeat him. So through my consecration, that day when I was left crying at my piano and all the tears flowed, she removed, she instantly removed all my fears, all my anxieties, and put a word upon my heart, limitless, limitless. I grew up, I'm Italian American, first generation. My parents came over from Italy and they were afraid. So they, they raised us with so much love and protection, very, very strict. It was the only way they knew how to do it. But we, my siblings and I, all carried this fear to where we wouldn't even drive on the highway. You know, we were, we were, we were just afraid. And so Our Lady, when I was 40 years old, healed me of that. And now I travel, I flew here by myself. <laughs> I flew here by myself. I fly all over the world. I've sung at the Vatican uh, for the Epiphany Vigil Mass. I've sung all over Poland, all over Italy, the Caribbean, all over the US, Canada. And 99% I'm flying by myself. But I know Our Lady's got me. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus has me, Our Lady has me. So I hope I can inspire you all to to consecrate your lives, your families, your husbands to the Blessed Mother who will lead you to Jesus. So it's really consecration to Jesus through his mother. Um, how much time do we have? I've got five more minutes. Can we do another song? You can learn more about me on annanuzo.com and all of my CDs. I have six CDs. They're available on all the digital streaming sites, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, YouTube, and there are many products available out there as well. Right now, I'd love to sing my Divine Mercy song. So this is the three o'clock hour prayer. This is on my first album as well. And later, a year later, it turned into the whole Divine Mercy chaplet. So this was the seed that led to the entire song chaplet. So if you all wanna kind of close your eyes Center your, center your minds and, and think of your intentions, your intentions for Jesus right now. If, there's, if you're suffering from an illness, 
if you have a loved one who's, who's suffering from an illness or dying or um, if you have anxieties and fears that you want Jesus and Our Lady to help heal you from, if you have your children who are away from the faith, if you have anything on your heart, friends, loved ones, unemployment, depression, thoughts of suicide, thoughts of abortion, I pray that you offer it up right now and trust in Jesus. Jesus, I trust in you. And now we'll do the Divine Mercy song. You expire, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls. You expire, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls. And the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. And the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. Oh, the
Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Sacred Heart of Jesus, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us. Thank you so much. I apologize that the music was a little softer than, than I thought it was going to be, but I hope it moved you and opened your hearts and prepared you for Father Chris Aylar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, what a beautiful voice. Um, Anna's been here for the last week uh, giving uh, some retreats and hymns and singing around, around Sydney. Please pray for her ministry. She's, she's got a, a website, annanuzzo.com, and happy to say hello to you afterwards uh, during the lunch break. And at the end, she's got some of her CDs, um, her albums and USBs, pouches, bracelets. It's, so please pray for her. She's sung at the Vatican. She sung uh, at the Divine Mercy Shrine in Poland. She sung all over the world, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful testimony. So thank you, Anna, um, and uh, looking forward to this weekend. Yeah, with you and Father Chris, great combination. So my name is Shabal Reish. I want to. Um, I'm the director of Perusia, and been working with uh, Divine Mercy Australia on this tour. And just a, a fun little backstory. And Father might appreciate this. It was a, I saw Father in July last year in the United States at the Catholic Marketing Network, and Anna, is, of course, and it was the idea of first flag of him potentially coming to Australia. And uh, about a month later, I came back, and nobody knew that this was going to happen, I, and, and praying, and we got confirmation, yes, it's looking good for May. And I get a phone call from just a random phone call from Salim. If anyone from this parish knows who Salim is, and he said... Um, it would be really good if we could get Father Chris Ayla to Australia, and I'll do whatever it takes to help you get that done. Little did he know that it, we got confirmation that day, and, uh, and I, I let him finish, and I said, well, Salim, praise be to God, your prayers have been answered. He's just confirmed he's coming to Australia. So that was in May. So this is how God works. Yeah. So Salim, uh, thank you for, for your uh, prayers for this. I want to thank Father Carlos and the priests here and uh, Leone and all of the helpers here at Our Lady of the Angels. This is a beautiful parish, a beautiful faith community, and uh, you're doing wonderful work here. So thank you very much. So let's uh, get straight into this first talk. Uh, Father Chris Ayla, he needs no introduction, but let me just say a few things. Very recently he's been appointed Provincial Superior, um, Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, Province. So this is in the United States and Argentina. Father, he's the director of the Association of Marian Helpers at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, Stockbridge in Massachusetts. He's, as you know, he started a series online, the Teaching the Faith series, and this was on Saturdays, over 140 talks, and, and, we, and some of these are millions and millions of views around the world. This was right through the whole COVID pandemic, and uh, so many people's lives have been touched, and we're hearing testimony after testimony about this. Father's only been a priest for nine years, so not that long, but now is Superior General of, 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 uh, of America and, and Argentina. So let's, let's really um, pray for him in this new role. He'll be there for six years, and he's going to be, if, if he wasn't busy already, he's going to be a lot busier now. Um, so we're blessed to have you here in Australia. So thank you very much, Father. He's just come back from Samoa. Pray for him. Is not 100% because it's been nonstop. But we pray for full recovery. And with all this army of prayers, I hope this will work for you, Father. Get back to 100%. So could you please welcome um, the Superior General, uh, Father Chris Ayla. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you can understand my Yankee accent. So uh, can everybody hear me OK? Okay, thank you. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and hearts to receive the grace that you wish to bestow upon us, that we may, through the intercession of Blessed Mother Mary and Saint Faustina, that we may be able to be living examples of your mercy. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I feel like an astronaut with all my stuff up here. Actually, I had an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy. I was going to be um, a jet pilot, and that's all I was interested in growing up. Uh, I come from a military family. Um, I, my dad flew helicopters out of Da Nang in Vietnam. I had several um, relatives in World War II, and in fact, that's one of the reasons I love the Aussies is because of their bravery, and hopefully the young recognize what beautiful, brave men that fought and gave their life for freedom, especially at places like Port Moresby, uh, the Bataan Death March. I don't know if any of you have heard about that, but I went to the Philippines they told me that the bravest of the brave usually is the Americans. We are usually the ones that have been the beacon of bravery, but they were telling two of the older people who survived, they had a little video of them like from 20 years ago, and they said really it was the Aussies. They were so brave in just the face of such trial. And that's what we're facing today, is it not? We're facing such trial. And I, I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to begin um, a whole tour of Australia, and I'll be doing different talks um, at each of the places. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to be doing three talks tomorrow. And so um, we'll make the announcement of the times and locations, but I'm going to be doing different talks. This one, they wanted me to do the Divine Mercy, kind of the overview of what Divine Mercy is. And then on the other talks, I'm going to be doing like at St. Charbel's Monastery. I want to talk a little bit about St. Charbel. And so we're excited to talk to you today. You guys, you guys here today are going to get the main talk, which is Divine Mercy. Now, why? Why is that so important? Jesus made it very clear that Divine Mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. And that's why we're here. And so I love it, the fact that uh, um, on our YouTube videos, we get so many comments from Australia. And um, I don't know if any of you are here. If you are, please come introduce yourself to me afterwards because I recognize the screen names. And I read every single comment, every single one. And we get so many good ones from Australia. Uh, good followers, and so we're very blessed. And um, even sometimes they give me little interesting facts, like, Father, did you know that we get most, more snow in the Australian o Alps than in the Swiss Alps? Did you guys know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. And it took a lady on YouTube from Australia to tell me that. And, and so the really interesting little tidbits like that about such a great country. And here's another one. Uh, one lady wrote to me on the YouTube comments. Um, Tasmania. Do you know that it has the cleanest air in the entire world? Tasmania. And so you have such a great and rich place here. And we're praying for Australia. You know, Australia is one of the few nations that is strong enough right now to stand up to the aggression of China. And so we're asking that Aussies stay with us, stay with the Americans in this fight for freedom. So God bless you all. Now, why is this so important? Because our fight for freedom involves religious liberty. Right now that's being stripped away in the West. And Jesus, as I was saying, told St. Faustina, mankind's last hope of salvation is divine mercy. He said there, John Paul II said, there is nothing mankind needs more than divine mercy. He said, if you do not pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. And I always say, you don't want to have to go through the doors of justice. Okay, we ain't going to make it. We're not going to make it. 
And so this is why it is so powerful. And it goes around the world. It goes around the world. And you know, in fact, I was at Medjugorje um, a few years ago, and I came out of the confessional. And I was going to go to the left. Has anybody here ever been to Medjugorje? Oh, wow. Okay, good number. And you know how they have all the confessionals? All the confessionals are in a straight line. And I, I was hearing confession for hours in English. And as I came out of the confessional, I went to go left. I wanted to go down to adoration. You know, they have that monstrance the size of a, a small. It's the biggest thing you've ever seen. And all of a sudden, something pulled me to the right. And there was this young lady standing. And there's this huge crowd, like thousands of people. And all of a sudden, I just happened to glance. Something pulled my glance over to the right. And I'm seeing all of these people. And there's a young lady that was crying, standing all by herself. So I went up to her and I said, are you okay? And she said, no. And she's sobbing. <clears throat> And she said, no. And I said, well, may I ask what's wrong? I didn't know she was going to speak English, and she did. And I said, are you okay? And, and she said, no, I, I want to take my life. Life is not worth living. And now we had just finished, Brother Jason and I, and he was with me on that, um, our book, After Suicide. There's hope for them and for you. And this book helps not just with suicide, with any kind of suffering or loss. I just, I wrote it about suicide because it was my toughest trial with my grandmother who took her life. And I said to this woman, I said, she, she said, I want to take my life. And I said, no, that's never the right answer. I said, and she says, but nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. That's the definition of mercy. Mercy is God, is mercy. Divine mercy is God's love put into action to help us in suffering. And mercy for us is when we put our love into action to help the suffering of someone else. Now, I said to this girl, of course somebody loves you. And that's the most important of all, God. And she said, yeah, but how do I know even God loves me? Well, first of all, you wouldn't have taken your last breath. You wouldn't be here right now if God didn't love you. And I said to this girl, you wouldn't be standing here talking to me if God didn't love you. This is the mercy of God. And the very fact that he keeps you in existence, he loves you. And that is worth living for. If nothing else... If everybody else disowned you and, and you have these struggles, nothing else is more important than God loving you, and he does. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, I said to her, we had a great conversation, and I told her about some of the things that I had just put in the book. And I said to her, you know, you got so much to live for. She was from Ukraine. Of all places, kind of ironic that this was right before the war broke out. And she was from Ukraine. And I said, if I may ask you, why, why do you want to take your life? And she said, again, because, you know, nobody loved her, whatever. I said, you don't want to take your life. God, God loves you. I said, but why would you want to take your life? You're, you're so beautiful and you speak English so well. <laughs> I don't know why I asked that question. You know what she said to me? She said, Father, I don't speak English. I only speak Ukrainian. And I said, what? And I said, well, I don't speak Ukrainian. I said, I only speak English. And she says, no, Father, you are talking to me in Ukrainian. And I said, no, you talk to me in English. That is the beautiful gift that we're going to celebrate tomorrow. Pentecost. 
where we all are going to be united under the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the answer. And that is what God gives us in divine mercy. And so this is why we have something so important and so absolutely needed today. You know, divine mercy is not new. It's not something new. It goes back to the Garden of Adam and Eve where Jesus gave us, or God gave us, the gift of a mother and the promise of a savior. And nothing, nothing is going to be more important in your life other than receiving the sacraments, confession, communion, than what you're going to hear here today. Nothing. Nothing. Because what you're going to hear today is how you can save your soul and your loved ones. How Jesus gave us the roadmap. All right, now, Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus commissioned the apostles to go out, right? And then later, centuries later, he made Faustina the secretary of divine mercy, this little tiny nun, uh, that nobody expected her to do anything great. And now the Marian fathers, of which I was just reelected as the provincial superior, and you know, that's kind of scary, because now that means I am morally responsible for all these guys. Please pray for me. Because it's just like you as a parent. Do you know you're morally responsible for your children? Do you know that when you go before God one day, if your children were not raised or at least attempted to be raised in the faith, you will be held responsible. Now, you taught them and showed them and loved them, but they chose to go off then no, you're not responsible. But if you never pass your faith onto your children, if you don't live like Christ in your life, you will be held responsible. We're called to be God-like. And this is the criticalness, all right? So God, Jesus coming as the divine mercy is what we're going to talk about today. And, and it was entrusted to us, Marian fathers, to spread around the world, all right? And then we brought it to the United States, and then the world. You all may know some of our well-known priests, Father Don Calloway. Here, anybody know Father Don Calloway? Father Mike Gately. Um, so we Marians have a lot of priests that are out talking about divine mercy. All right, so let's go to our next slide. So if the people upstairs can flip to the next slide. What is this? This is the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, okay? And this, this video, or excuse me, this... this uh, uh, let's see here. This um, is our national shrine at the United, um, or the uh, National Shrine in Lockbridge, Massachusetts. And so this is very important because you might recognize this from EWTN. Do you guys get EWTN here in Australia? Okay, we have a show on called Living Divine Mercy that you're not going to want to miss. It's, it's definitely a show that you're going to want to see. Great story. And a news is one of our our stories and her singing and we've had great great stories we have one story of a guy named zion clark whose body is cut off right here i don't know how he survives because even some of the lower organs in the body his body's cut off right below the chest we had his amazing story on and so there are so many incredible stories that god gives us well anyway god made us that we are for him. Now, this is important because why do we go to shrines? Why do we come here? Why do you go to churches to find Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. And what one word best is God? Love, love. All right, let's go to our next slide. Let's go to our next slide. So God is love. Is somebody up there? God is love. All right. <laughs> Somebody's up there. All right. So God is love. This is the one word that best describes God. Now, you know what mercy is? Mercy is the highest form of that love. It's the highest form of that love. All right. Love is the greatest of all virtues. Faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. But within love, we have several different kinds of love. We have love that 
I love fishing. And I wanted John Canavan, who's Mr. Divine Mercy Australia, to take me great white shark fishing. He said, Father, you can't catch great white sharks. I said, John, I want to go great white shark fishing. So I said, okay, if I can't get a great white, can you take me mako shark fishing? I want to catch at least a mako shark. And so the whole thing is we can love people. We can love things in a different way. All right. Some of you may love Australian rules football, right? I love college football in the United States, American football. All right. So, but the highest, the Greeks, they actually gave three forms of love. The first form is called eros, which is you desire something. Like I said, I like ice cream or I like football. The next form of love is filial. It's like, I love you as a brother or sister. But the highest form of love is agape love. That I will love you to death. I will give you my life. And that form of love, that highest form of love, when it's put into action, is called mercy. Mercy is the highest form of love. You can't do better. And so this is why the greatest mode of love is mercy. It's the highest form. It's when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. So for instance, if you just tell me I love you, or you tell me you love me, or I tell you I love you, but then when the chips are down, you don't, that's not true love. That's not true mercy. There was a lady who brought her husband to the shrine, and they were talking with us, and she said, go ahead, tell Father Chris that and this couple was very interesting because he wanted nothing to do with religion. He wanted nothing to do with religion whatsoever. And she was telling him that, uh, I want to invite you to Mass. I want you to come to Mass with me. He says, no, no, no. I don't need to go to Mass. God knows I love him. I don't need to sit in a church. God knows I love him. She says, well, don't you want to visit Jesus? Even if you don't go to Mass... Why not visit Jesus in the tabernacle in adoration? And he said, no, Jesus knows I love him. I don't need to go to some church. And she says, you don't want to visit Jesus? He said, no, no, no. He knows I love him. Well, anyway, one day he went in for a very basic knee procedure, something on his knee, and he got a huge infection. And all of a sudden, they had to whisk him in for this infection and he was admitted overnight at the hospital and so he called home and he told his wife that oh my goodness you know I'm actually in the hospital and he said what what time can you come tonight to see me <laughs> you could see where this is going so she took it as an opportunity to learn or teach and she said well sorry I've got the kids I got to pick up, the grandkids. I got to rush them to soccer practice. She says, I got to run errands. I got to go to the grocery store. I got to run to the laundry. She says, but you know I love you. <laughs> and he said, but you're not going to come see me? And she says, oh, I don't have to come see you. You know that I love you. <laughs> and he said, well, if you love me, you'll come see me. You'll come visit me. And then he stopped and said, ah, I see what you are saying. In order for love to be true love, it's just not professing Jesus with your mouth and saying, Lord, I love you. You're my personal Lord and Savior. It is living that love. And when you put that love into action, it is mercy. It's the highest form of love put into action. So now what we have is a very important devotion that's coming up, we're going to tell you about. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Okay. And if you can see, there's a great definition. Mercy is having pains in your heart for the pains of another and taking pains to do something about their pain. Wow, that's a lot of pain, isn't it? <laughs> but that's the answer. That's the answer. And so let's go to our next slide. I love this painting. I love this painting. This painting is something you may have seen or not. Can, I, can we go to the next slide, please? Have you all seen this? What's in that guy's hands? In one hand is a nail, 
And then what's in the other hand? A hammer. And when I was in La Salette, they actually have this crucifix. And on the end of the crucifix, it's incredible. It has two things. On one end of the nail, or on the crucifix, is a hammer. And on the other end of the, of the uh, cross is a pair of pliers. So they call that the La Salette crucifix. You know why? You have a choice. Are you going to take the hammer and drive another nail into Jesus? Or are you going to take a pair of pliers and pull the nail out of Jesus' hands on the cross? Do you know this is fascinating to me? Because we have a choice, even now, to either nail Christ to the cross or to remove the nails from the cross. And people say, well, Father, he died 2,000 years ago. No, God is outside of time. God is outside of time. And so we, therefore, we know in many, many ways that what we do today hurt Jesus in his passion. Do you know Jesus told St. Faustina that it was her prayers that got him through his agony in the garden? You know what's the most humbling thing for me in the world? When you see Jesus in those paintings, sweating blood, in the agony in the garden, that those tears in a big part were my sins. He saw all the sins for all eternity. And therefore, he is now, right now, that's mercy. Basically, mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. That guy's unlovable. He's pounding nails into Jesus. That guy's unforgivable, but yet Jesus loves him and forgives him. You know, this is a fascinating stat. That This is my own personal view. But do you guys, does anybody here know how many people are on the earth today? How many? More than that. There's more than that at an Aussie Rules football game. How many people are on the earth today? Okay, close to 8 billion. Close to 8 billion. Okay? Now here's something that's my own personal view, but I believe it, believe it, believe it. If each one of us was nailed, taken out into that grassy area out there, and nailed to a cross, because remember, what's the penalty for sin, or uh, why did Jesus die on the cross? Because the penalty for sin is death, right? When you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. And therefore, when we sin, you deserve to die. I deserve to die when I sin. It's that serious. And so, if every one of us, because of our sins, were taken outside and nailed on a cross, what would we feel? We would feel only our own pain, right? And by the way, was Jesus nailed through the hands or the wrists? Hands or wrists? Both. They've proven it today. Every image you see of Jesus on the front palms, the in the palm. But on the shroud, you see the back of his arms, the wound comes out the wrist. You know why? They nailed criminals at an angle so when the nail went into the hand of Jesus it went through the tendons and came out the wrist so the nail went in here and out here that's why in the image of divine mercy you see the wounds here on the pans but when Jesus is on the shroud you see what the wounds on the wrist. Now, if every one of us was taken outside and nailed to a cross, you would feel what? You would feel the pain for you. You would feel the pain of that nail going through your hand, through your feet. You would only feel that pain. You would not feel the pain of the nail going into my hand, into my feet. Now, you might have the pain of seeing me in agony, and I would have the pain of seeing you in agony. But the physical pain would only be from that nail going in your hand. Now, I asked you how many people are in the world today, you said, and the answer is 8 billion. 
Does anybody here know how many science guests, how many people have lived on the world, on the earth, since time began? Anybody? Science has a pretty good estimate that about 115 billion people have lived since the beginning of mankind. About 115 billion. Now here's what I believe. If you were nailed to that cross and you felt just your pain, didn't Jesus die for all people who ever lived? Now let's suppose Jesus doesn't come for another 50 years. And by that time, 200 billion people have lived. Let's just say that. Let's just say at the end of the world, by the time the world ends, 200 billion people will have lived. I believe that since Jesus died for every person who ever lived or will live, Jesus didn't feel the pain of that nail just for himself. Think of the agony that that would feel if you had a nail driven into your hand. I believe Jesus felt that pain 115 billion times greater because that's the number of people who have lived if the world ended tonight. If the world, I believe Jesus felt that pain 115 billion times more than we would. Now, does that give you some idea what Jesus did for you? And all of that is because of divine mercy. So let's keep going. We're going to tell you all about how to get this grace now. All right, now, this is something that God wants. We are suffering. Let's, let's go, somehow you're on the wrong slide again. Can we, can we go back, right there. Now, who's in this picture? This guy, he's suffering, right? God wants to do something about your suffering. Now, sometimes God may allow you to continue to suffer. Why? Why would God allow you to continue to suffer? Because suffering is redemptive. It can help purify us. It helps us to live in trust. I don't know, God, why I have this cancer, but somehow I'm trusting you that you will help me through it and I will be a good example to other people. But God wants to do something about our suffering. Even if he doesn't take away your physical, or emotional, or spiritual suffering, it will be used through his mercy for your redemption if you let it. Now, here's where we go. This is divine mercy. Basically, we are suffering. And where do we find the answer to our suffering? Slide. God, and where is God? In the church. In the church. This is where God wants us to do something. He wants to do something about our suffering. Now, the Mass is the only perfect form of prayer. Yes, the Bible tells us we got to go into our room, shut the door, and pray to God in private. Private prayer is the first start to prayer. But the Mass is perfect form of prayer. It's the only perfect form of prayer. Why? Because the Mass is not your prayer. You're uniting yourself to the perfect form of prayer. The perfect form of prayer is this. The Mass is Jesus offering worship to the Father. And when you come to Mass, you're participating in that. No matter how good your prayer is, your prayer cannot compete with that. It can't. And so we have very much important, this is the mass, the perfect form of prayer. This is God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son, Jesus Christ, to God the Father. All taken up in the, in the mass and we are part of it. This is what is so important. This is it. This is why the mass is mercy. And don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in this, oh, the church is chauvinistic. Uh, and, and I'm not going to be part of the church because they discriminate against women. No. Don't fall for this woke stuff. Do you know that, I've said this before, maybe you've heard it. Do you know that a cloistered nun is a higher calling 
than a diocesan priest? Because living a life of contemplative prayer is a higher calling than anything. And so her vocation is higher than a diocesan priest. Not because he can confect the Eucharist, that's, that's the greatest of all things, but in their way of life, she is greater. So the church is not chauvinistic. Well then, Father, why doesn't the church allow women to be priests? Do you know why? The church can't change that. Why can, the, can the, the priest only be male? And it's not discrimination against females. It's because who is that priest at the altar? Despite his brokenness, he's Jesus, right? He's Jesus at that altar. And despite his brokenness or sinfulness, and please pray for your priests. Our priests are under such attack. You know, every day I worry. You know, I had this woman come. I was racing out of the shrine the other day and I was going over to the gift shop to bless some items. And this woman came up to me and she said, Father, would you hear my confession? She had a very strong Russian accent. And I didn't think anything about it. And I said, sure. And it was a, so our office was closed. And I took my pass card and I took her into the building and into my office. So we were all alone. There was nobody with us. It was just me and this woman. And she said, in the midst of her confession, she said, Father, do you realize that the KGB, they still call it the KGB. It's not really the KGB, but it's the communist kind of like FBI. And she says, they know who you are. <laughs> I said, what? And she said, they know who you are. And she said, be careful. And then she went on to tell me some things that I was then scared. Because she was saying things I can't reveal what she said in her confession, but she was saying things that were scary for priests who were trying to preach the truth. And if you all know me, God gave me a big mouth. <laughs> and if, if God gives you a big mouth, you might as, I figured, yeah, I might as well use it for you, God. And she's, she was telling me all these things that really scared me. And, and I know that's just the evil one because he wants me to be afraid. There are priests now that won't hear confessions unless they're behind a glass, a room with glass windows and, and where they can't, you know, they'd be afraid of being accused of anything. Uh, you guys had a wonderful cardinal here, Cardinal Pell, right? Yeah, Cardinal Pell, God bless you. And let me tell you something. A lot of what people criticize Cardinal Pell, he was found to be completely innocent. But a priest, please pray for them because they are attacked. They will be attacked. And especially if we have big mouths. So... The priest has to be a man, and it's not sexism, it's not chauvinistic. The priest, and he's behind that altar, is Christ. Now, what happens at the Mass? Christ, the priest, gives from that altar, is the life-giving seed that comes from this altar in the form of Christ's body and blood. And when he's at this altar, that life-giving seed comes off, comes to you, and is received by what? The church. And that's why we call the church what? Feminine. Feminine. She receives. She receives. That's why we call the church feminine. 
So she receives the seed that comes from the altar via the priest. And the priest is the one who gives that life-giving seed out to the people, the church, the congregation. And Mother Church, she, notice Mother Church, two things, feminine and mother gives birth to. And so the church receives that seed and from it, she nurtures it and gives it life. If you don't come to this church and get reinvigorated with life, it's your own fault. If you were to have a woman up here, first of all, she can't be in persona Christi. Christ was a man and we can't change that. But another reason is because a woman doesn't give the seed. She receives the seed. That's why the church is called feminine. Even the men and the women in the church are called feminine. If you have a woman up here at the altar, she can't give the seed. And her lover is the church. Do you know who my spouse is? As a priest, you know who my spouse is? The church. I was engaged to be married. And Gina was the greatest thing God could have ever sent me. She helped keep me on the straight and narrow. She was always looking out for me. She always took care of me. And I, I was like, we were planning on getting married. And, and I just, I couldn't, I, I didn't know what was, why I couldn't do it. And she was like, what's wrong? And I was just like, I love you so much. If there's anybody in this world I was going to marry, it would be you. But... There's something here, and the whole time it was God calling me on my vocation to the priesthood. And I was just like, Lord, I can't, I can't do two things. I can't be a priest and a husband. But as a male, both are giving seed. If I was to marry Gina, I would be giving that life-giving seed that she would have received and we would have had children. As a priest, you give that life-giving seed to the church and you receive it as the feminine. And then it grows and bears life. If this is a woman at the altar, it's lesbianism. It's lesbianism. Because the lover is feminine. The spouse of the priest is feminine. And if she's a woman, you, you have lesbianism. And so nobody understands this. It's kind of like the Trinity. You have to understand that we said one word that describes God is what? Love. Now, some of you may have heard me say in the past, so important, it fits here though. If God is love, and I always, I was in Samoa, for the World Apostolic Congress of Mercy, and I was talking to the youth, and I asked him this, <clears throat> and I said, you know, we all know that love is the one word to describe God, but if I, what about love between us? I said, if I'm the only person who've ever existed, none of you ever existed, no eight billion people, just one, me, none of you, just me, I'm the only one who ever ex existed, can there be love? Can there be love? Yeses. No. There can be no love. Because in order to have love, you need a community of persons to love one another. This is why God's a trinity. If God is love, you can't have just one person. God is three persons. Why? Because there's a perfect love between them. You have God the Father. He's the lover. You have God the Son, the beloved. And the love between them is so great, St. Augustine tells us, that from it comes a third person, the Holy Spirit. So you have God the Father, the lover. God the Son, the beloved. And the love between them is so great that from it comes a third person. The love is so amazing that it generates, it, it, from it proceeds a third person. In the 
Can we not pray? And the, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. So we have the Father and the Son. The love between them is so great in the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit is, tomorrow we celebrate Pentecost. It's simply the love between the Father and the Son. That love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So the family is a mirror of that. God created us in the perfect mirror of the Trinity. You have the husband, the lover. You have the wife, the beloved. And the love between them is so great that from it comes a third person, the child. Even if you can't bear children, that love is still so great that by nature God created it. You can come from it a third person, the child. You can't have that between two men. You can't have that between two women. Men and women can love each other, but in a filial way, not in the life-giving way of the seed being received by the female, generating life and giving birth. That is what happens right here in this church. And that is mercy. God giving you this life-giving seed from this altar in the form of the body and blood of Christ is mercy. Now I'm way behind, but we're going to keep going here. Okay, so basically this here is a picture of the church. Now, please don't give up on your church. The church is the way God established for us to receive his mercy. Christ established, you know, don't you love it when people say father or to you, whoever you're talking to, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. <laughs> I'm not into organized religion. You know what I always say? That's too bad because Jesus organized religion. Otherwise he would have come to earth. He didn't need 12 apostles. He didn't need to establish the papacy, which he did, and then put Peter upon it. How do we know this? It's in the Bible, Matthew 16, 18. You are Peter, and upon the rock I will build my church. And people, oh, don't get messed up with this. Have you ever heard this argument? Oh, well, Father, the, the word, you know, in the Greek, because what, what language was the Bible written in? Greek. The masculine is Petros. The feminine is Petra, okay? And so what people say, and don't fall for this, is people say, well, he didn't mean Peter because in the Greek it says Petra and it would have meant Petros, Peter's a man. So that wipes away every one of your Catholic arguments that he was referring to Peter on the rock to which he built his church. You know what the answer to that is? How do you answer that when somebody tries to tell you when Jesus spoke the word Petra, he couldn't have been talking about Peter because if he was, he would have said Petros. How do you answer that? Jesus didn't speak Greek. <laughs> Jesus spoke Aramaic. And in that language, there's only one word for rock, kephale. So he was talking about Peter. The Greek translation into the New Testament came decades later. Jesus didn't speak it. It's possible for him to say feminine when he didn't speak Greek. Christ established the church. He made it his body on earth. This is his mercy. For instance, does anybody think that Jesus would come to earth and say, I'm going to establish a church, which he did, Matthew 16, 18. But I'm going to get it wrong for 1,500 years before Martin Luther gets it right. <laughs> Impossible. What about the Bible? I, I don't care, Father. None of this is in the Bible. None of this is in the Bible. In fact, does the Bible say that everything has to be in the Bible? No, it doesn't. The Bible itself, if you don't believe me, look up the last paragraph of the last chapter of the last gospel, John. It says not everything is in the Bible. What does the Bible say about artificial intelligence? Nothing. What does the Bible say about nuclear war? Nothing. 
What does the Bible say about contraception? Nothing. Does that mean these things are unimportant? Of course they're important. And this is why we have to understand not everything is the Bible. This is why God gave us the church. So she can, through her catechism, teach us about these other things using 100% biblical foundation. Now, does anybody believe, and people always say, oh, you Catholics, you're a church that's Satan. You're not, you're not even Christian. You ever hear that? Well, you know how you answer that? Say, well, gee, seeing that, that there was only one Christian church for 1,500 years, and Jesus established a church, and there was only the Catholic church for 1,500 years, kind of makes it a pretty good, good bet that the Catholic church is the church of Christ. There's no other church for 1,500 years. Do you know that every other of the 40,000 religion, Christian religions, I can give you the name of who founded it? Do you know that there's a website called whostartedyourchurch.com? <clears throat> and in, in the thousands of churches, it tells you who created them and when. You know the only one that it says Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church. Do you know if you go to Siri on your cell phone? Siri on your cell phone and you say, hey Siri, who started the Catholic Church? You know what it says? Jesus Christ. Do it. Ask your phone. Hey Siri, who started the Catholic Church? Jesus Christ. Do you know if you say, hey Siri, who started the Mormon Church? What does it say? Joseph Smith. If you say, hey Siri, who started the Episcopalian Church? What does it say? Samuel C. Uh, Seabury. Do you want to follow a church started by Jesus Christ or Samuel Seabury? <laughs> it makes perfect sense. You're in the church of Christ. Please don't ever give it up. Don't ever give it up. And so the church even gave us the Bible. What came first? The, the Mass or the Bible? The Mass. You know why the Bible was created? To be read at the Mass. You know, any non-Catholic Protestant that tells you that you're not following the Bible, you've got to ask them, do you know where the Bible comes from? Well, it comes from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But do you know in the first centuries how many Gospels were floating around? There was the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary. Now, that doesn't mean Mary wrote it or Peter wrote it. That's another fallacy. People say the church crushed these things and suppressed them and, and because they didn't want them being taught, because they exposed the wickedness of the Catholic Church. No, they weren't written by Mary. They weren't written by Peter. They weren't written by Thomas. These things are called the apocryphal gospels. And you know how the church, who determined, I always say, who determined that the Gospels are only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go to any non-Catholic who has a Bible, what will you find? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You go to a Methodist, what are you going to find in their Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no other Gospels. You go to an Episcopalian, what are you going to find in their Bible? Only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no others. Who determined that only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were inspired by the Holy Spirit and all the others weren't? The bishops of the Catholic Church. So you can't accept the Bible and reject the authority from which it came, which is the Catholic Church. You can't do it. And so, I'm sorry, like I said, I'm way, way behind here. All right, let's go to our next slide. This, what is this? This is an actual, the tw I know you can't probably see that real well, but that's an actual photo of our shrine in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It looks photoshopped, it's so amazing. There's the shrine in the background, there's the 12th station, Jesus on the cross. Now I said before that this is why Jesus died, because our penalty for sin is death. Jesus paid that penalty. Now at every mass, we see Jesus on the cross. 
Do we not? Every Mass we see Jesus on the cross. And people will say, why do you keep re-crucifying Christ? At every Mass he's on the cross. No, we don't keep re-crucifying Christ. When you come to the Mass, you're at Calvary. You're here as Jesus is paying your debt to sin. What's the debt to sin? Death. When you come to Mass, you are there on Calvary. It's not re-crucifying him. You're there at the actual crucifixion because God is outside of time. There's no past for God. There's no future for God. Everything is one big eternal present moment. And when you come to Mass, you are at Calvary. Pope Benedict tells us at Mass, the roof of the church opens up. Angels come down. Saints come down. And heaven and earth are united. And this is so important because this is the wage, as I said, for sin is death. And we don't keep re-crucifying. We're at Calvary. And so at the Mass, we receive mercy in the form of Holy Communion. God gave his life for us. That's the ultimate form of love, agape. When you love somebody so much, you're willing to give your life for them. He died so you don't have to. Now let's go to our next slide. But mercy, while it's seen most in the Mass, is not new. It goes back to the beginning of time. Adam and Eve. Now I'm going to go through this real quickly. But the problem with Adam and Eve was what? People will say, well, they sinned. Yeah, true. But the problem with Adam and Eve is not just so much that they sinned. The problem with Adam and Eve is they didn't do the three things you need to get to heaven. Does anybody remember from my previous talks what three things you've got to do to get to heaven? I'm going to summarize the entire Bible for you right now. The entire Bible is summarized. You want to get to heaven? I want to get to heaven. We wouldn't be here if we didn't want to get to heaven. If we want to get to heaven, you got to do these three things. Let's look at our next slide. The ABCs. The problem with Adam and Eve wasn't so much they sinned. It's what happened after. What Adam and Eve did afterwards was a bigger problem. They didn't know their ABCs. A, ask for God's mercy. The Bible says in order to get to heaven, you must repent and ask for forgiveness. God's mercy. If you do not do A, you will not get to heaven. B, you must be merciful to each other. People say, oh, well, that's not mandatory. Yes, it is. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And you guys didn't. Away with you into the fire. That doesn't sound optional. That's works of love, not works of the law. Works of love. And so, you must be merciful to each other. You're not going to get to heaven. All right? And see, we all want to get to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, grace. And Jesus told St. Faustina, trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. You got to trust Jesus. Even if you're sick and you're not healed, you got to trust there's a better reason for it. You've got to trust that that pain and suffering is your cross, that like Jesus, his cross led to his resurrection. If you don't get healed and you continue to suffer, you've got to realize, okay, somehow, Lord, I trust you. I don't know how or why or what you're doing here, but if this is the cross I've got to carry in order for me and my children and husband to get to heaven, I accept it. You've got to trust. Now, here's the problem. Did Adam and Eve, A, ask for God's mercy? No. They never once said, we're sorry. They made excuses. The, saint, the serpent did it. He showed it to me and it looked good. B, be merciful to each other. Did Adam and Eve be merciful to each other? No. In fact, Adam blamed Eve. He said, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. <laughs> it's her fault. And C, did they trust in God? No, they ran and they hid. And God said, why are you hiding? They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him. And so... This is why we have to know our ABCs. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Okay, so the message of divine mercy is this. A, B, C. You've got to have it. If you want to get to heaven, 
You cannot shuck this. You cannot ignore it. If you don't have those ABCs, you do not get to heaven. If you are missing any one of the three, you don't get to heaven. If you have all three, you will guarantee to get to heaven. You got to ask for mercy. The best way is in that confessional. Two, you got to be merciful to each other. You got to love like Christ did. And three, you got to trust God that even in the trials and tribulations, somehow he has my best interest in mind. I don't know what it is, but I'll learn it after I die. Even if you have to die of cancer in the meantime, those are the things. All right. And so this is the message of divine mercy. Pope Benedict said this message of divine mercy is the heart of the nucleus of the gospel. It's not optional. And so if you have, again, all three, you'll get to heaven. Now let's look at our next slide. God's been trying to give this message to the whole world for centuries. He's risen up angels and prophets and saints to try to teach us about his mercy, but we don't listen. We don't pay attention. We didn't do it for centuries. So finally, what does God do? Let's go to our next slide. He raises up this great saint named St. Faustina, and you have a chapel right here under the side with St. Faustina's relic. This is the chosen soul for the, the, the end of the world. Why? Because Jesus told her, you, St. Faustina, will help prepare the world for my final coming. You, St. Faustina. In essence, God been trying to give this message of mercy, ABC, for the the 5th century, 6th century, 10th, 7th century, 10th century, 15th century, 18th century, 19th century. Finally, he gets to the 20th century and he gives it to this little nun. In essence, basically, Jesus said, that's it, I'm done. And how do we know that? God said, you, St. Faustina, will prepare the world for my final coming. That's it, we're done. And so this is important because this isn't who you would expect. This is somebody who was just living a simple life as a simple nun. She wasn't anything special, but God doesn't pick who you would expect. All right? I always see this before. Like, do you know Moses? God picked Moses, right? I, it drives me nuts when people say, we don't need any intercessor between God and man. Well, who was Moses? God wouldn't talk to the people. He only talked through Moses. And do you know Moses stuttered so bad nobody could understand him. Moses could not speak. And we think of him as this great orator. Moses couldn't speak very well. He stuttered. And he said, God, don't choose me. Use my brother. Who was Moses' brother? Aaron. You, Aaron. And he said, no, I'm going to use you. Mary, poor. She had no money, no influence, but God used her to change the world. What about St. Paul? You may have heard me say before, St. Paul is hilarious. You always see these big hulking statues in Rome, this big St. Paul with a lightning bolt and the gospels in his hand, and he's crushing all the poems. He's this big hulking figure. You know who St. Paul was? We know this from the apocryphal gospels. They can serve some purpose. Paul, St. Paul was ball-headed, bow-legged, Hook nose and four foot eight. St. <laughs> Paul was four foot eight and changed the world. I can't imagine looking down on St. Paul, <laughs> and even I would. And yet, this guy changed the world. We don't have a church without St. Paul. God doesn't pick who you would expect, and he didn't certainly. You would expect it to change the world through some nun. John Paul II said that she's nobody from nowhere, but God used her to change the world. Let's watch this one clip little video. Assured of what she must do, Faustina left for Warsaw at once. There she was rejected at every convent door except one. The Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, a religious order dedicated to helping prostitutes reform their lives. After Faustina entered the Sisters of Mercy, her superior, in her notes, assessed the new novice as no one special and put Faustina to work to pay for her religious clothing. She was a simple, uneducated nun with just three grades of elementary schooling. She rarely left the convent and performed the most mundane tasks. Her life appeared so ordinary on the outside. 
She was busy working and spent part of her time in the chapel. Every day she met the same people. Her day had the same rhythm. So on the outside, she led a dull, humdrum existence. Beneath her perceived dull existence, Faustina's deep inner life overflowed with extraordinary mystical graces, divine revelations, and heavenly visitations. Christ began appearing frequently to her in visions, sometimes as the King of Mercy, resplendent in light and majesty. At other times, he appeared as the tortured, crucified Christ. At the request of her spiritual director, Faustina began privately to record these mystical experiences in a diary. Okay, let's go to our next slide. He's talking about this. This is the diary of St. Faustina. So if we can go to the next slide, that's this. This, next to the Bible, is the most incredible spiritual, theological writing in the history of the world. Don't get intimidated that it's 700 pages. It, it's unbelievable what's in these pages. So much so that this is the reason that I gave up everything I had house, boat, living on the lake, beautiful fiance, to go and spread this message, the most important message of our times. You know, this is funny because she had no education. She could barely read and write, yet God gave her this diary in five new channels of grace. Five new channels of grace that some of you may know. Let's go to our next slide. It's called the Devotion of Divine Mercy. And we know it by the acronym FINCH. The Feast of Divine Mercy, the Image of Divine Mercy, the Novena of Divine Mercy, C is the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and H is the Hour of Mercy. Now this is the devotion of Divine Mercy. Earlier, the ABCs are the image of Divine Mercy. That's not optional. Are devotions optional in the Catholic Church? Yes, you don't have to follow devotions. In other words, you do not have to pray the chaplet of divine mercy to get to heaven, technically. But we're going to strongly suggest you do. And I'm going to tell you why. All right, now, I'm almost out of time, but I'm going to cover these real quick. <clears throat> because these are the five channels of grace that you need right now. All right, let's start with our first one. Now, she, the Feast of Divine Mercy. Now, Jesus gave her all these in 1931. Why... Why he did this is why he gave a devotion is to live a stronger message of divine mercy. Because if you're not asking for mercy, being merciful to each other, and completely trusting in God, ABC, you need to practice. You need to practice those things. And before you can live those things, the devotion, Finch, is the way you practice. This is what's going to help you live a stronger message of mercy. So let's go to our next slide. Divine Mercy Sunday. That is Stockbridge, Massachusetts. You see Anna playing the organ and me right next to her. See that? <laughs> and so this is Stockbridge, Massachusetts. 25 people, 25,000 people come up. We are the epicenter. And please, if you haven't watched our EWTN show, Living Divine Mercy, it's on EWTN. Please look it up. But the people come here for a major reason. I'm going to go through these real quick. Okay, first of all, when is Divine Mercy Sunday? The Sunday after Easter. Now, you may have heard me say this before, but it's worth reiterating because it's so important. Jesus said it has to be on that day. It can't be any other day. Why? Because he said it's got to be on the eighth day. What is the eighth day? Well, the Easter octave, when an octave, what does octave mean? Octave means eight. And so when we celebrate feasts in the church, we have octaves. We have octave of Christmas, which starts on Christmas Day, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, January 1st. So we celebrate the octave of Christmas by finishing with what feast? January 1st, Mary, the mother of God. Because you can't separate Christmas from Mary, the mother of God. They go together. That's a Christmas octave. Then you have the Easter octave. What's the Easter octave? 
it starts on Easter Sunday, right? Day one. Easter Sunday, day one. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Divine Mercy Sunday, the eighth day. Why is that important? Why did Jesus say it has to be on the eighth day? Well, why didn't he pick the seventh day? What's the perfect number in the Bible? No, it's not eight. Seven. Seven is the perfect number in the Bible. Then why didn't Jesus say I want it on the seventh day, which is the Saturday, which would have been the Sabbath? Because the number seven to the Jews represented creation, time, this earth. But you know what the number eight represents to the Jews? Eternity. The number eight represents eternity. So everybody, in a nutshell, here, day one, Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven on Easter Sunday. The next seven days are symbolic of your pilgrimage on earth called life. But on that eighth day, you're going to die. It's symbolic that you're going to enter into eternity. Your immortal soul, your body is done. Your soul, well, I mean, you'll get it back. And, and you know, it's funny because people always ask, Father, when I get my body in heaven, is it the same? Because I really don't like this body. And I said, yeah, in heaven, I'm going to be six foot eight. No, your body will be glorified. Your body will be glorified. And so that day when you enter a new eternity is symbolized by the eighth day. That's the day you're going to die. It represents eternity. And so this is why it's all important. So the first is Easter Sunday, the first day of the active. The next seven days are symbolic of our pilgrimage on earth. And then we enter into eternity on the eighth day. That's why Jesus said, I want this feast on the eighth day. Now, why did... St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Augustine, St. Thomas the Apostle, why did they all say that the eighth day is greater than the first day of the octave? Father Seraphim used to teach that Divine Mercy Sunday is greater than Easter. Whoa, Father, that's a little too much for me. Me too. I don't feel comfortable saying Divine Mercy Sunday is greater than Easter. You know why? They're the same feast. It's called the octave of Easter, and it includes all eight days. That's why we can eat meat on that Friday. Do you know, does everybody, do you guys understand that about eating meat? Do you know you're not supposed to eat meat, not just the Fridays in Lent, but every Friday of the whole year? Did you know that? You are supposed to now in the United States and other places, the church is given an indult, that you can eat meat on Friday, but then you got to give up some other form of penance. Okay? Now, Seraphim, Father Seraphim used to teach that the eighth day is greater, the Divine Mercy Sunday is greater than Easter. Now, I wouldn't go that far. I say they're the same. They celebrate the same feast. But it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Okay. Because on the first day, Easter, Jesus opened the door to heaven. But on the eighth day, you walk through that door. And the fact that that door is open or not is not as great as you walking through it. That is why St. Augustine said the eighth day is greater than the first day. Again, I, I see they're together. You can't separate them. So the purpose of the eighth day is that when Jesus, the groom, comes for his bride, at every moment of our death, whenever any one of us dies, Jesus is going to come for you. And as the groom, who is Jesus, he comes for his bride, you. Who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. And who's the church? Us. And so when Jesus comes, he wants to find his bride spotless, right? Now the problem is, when Jesus comes for you, the bride, is he going to find you spotless? Or is he going to find some stain on our wedding garment? What's our wedding garment? Our soul. Our soul. 
And so when Jesus comes on that eighth day, he's going to find you either spotless and pure white, or you're going to have stains. That eighth day, that Divine Mercy Sunday, is to clean us up so that when Jesus comes, he already opened the door to heaven. We lived our life the next seven days. On the eighth day, we go into eternity. Jesus comes for us, the bride, and he wants to take us to heaven to meet his mother and his father. But before he can take us to heaven to meet his mother and his father, we must be spotless. Nothing with any stain enters heaven. The Bible says so. So how do we get rid of that stain? Okay, this is the key. Now, the eighth day, Jesus wants to take us home to be spotless. But as I said, there could be two stains on our soul. Let's go to our next slide. This is confession. Why? Because the first stain on our soul is sin. If you have any sin on your soul... You got to get it washed up. Now, when you go to confession, do you got to confess every sin you're aware of? No. No, you don't. What do you have to confess? Every grave sin. Grave matter. Serious sin. And don't let non-Catholics teach you, oh, sin is sin. No, it's not. Paul said... Read the Bible. Some sin is deadly. Some sin is not deadly. The not deadly is called venial. The deadly sin is called mortal. You've got to wipe away those mortal sins in confession. And please don't hold back on confessing some sins and not others or your confession is invalid. If you're aware of one grave sin and you don't confess it, well, I was embarrassed, Father. Your confession is invalid. If you have one grave sin that you don't confess on purpose, your confession is invalid. So you must confess all your grave sins. Now, what about all the little venial sins? Do you have to confess those? No, why? Where are they forgiven? In the mass, the penitential rite. So technically, if you went to confession for all your grave sin... And you come here to Mass during the penitential rite, I confess to Almighty God and you, my brothers and sisters, you're cleansed of all your venial sin, then you're perfectly spotless when you come to, com to communion. Unless you sin between the penitential rite <laughs> and receiving Holy Communion, which I guess is possible, but you are receiving spotless. Now, when Jesus comes on that eighth day and we die, we want to be spotless, but there could be the stain of sin on our soul. So we got to get to confession. All right? Now, you've heard me say this before. In the confessional, is it the priest who forgives the sins? Yes! <laughs> yes! People are always going to tell you, I don't need to go to some man. Jesus, God can, can, uh, uh, forgives my sins. Yes, of course. But what does the gospel or the uh, book of James say? 5.16. It says, confess your sins to one another. Oh, well, that means just tell my best friend when I'm having a bad day. <laughs> no, confess your sins to one another. Who was Paul, uh, James talking about? Go up one verse. He's talking about the priests, the presbyters. Do you remember that part in the gospel where Jesus says to the leper? Y'all remember this? The leper was, was full of stain. And Jesus cleansed the leper, did he not? And what did Jesus say to the leper? Go and show the priest. And he will declare you clean so then you can be reunited into the faith community. Look it up. That's what Jesus told the leper. What happened? Jesus healed him. But the priest declared him clean. So when you go into that confessional, sin is like leprosy. You need to be cleansed. And when I say, I absolve you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit... You are cleansed. I'm declaring you clean. 
the priest. So now you can be reunited into the faith community. Jesus set that up. The reason we know the priest can forgive sin is because Jesus says what? In 1619, Matthew, or I'm sorry, Matthew 1619, Matthew 1818, John 20, 23. What does Jesus say? Whose sins you forgive are forgiven in heaven. Whose sins you retain are retained in heaven. Can you imagine heaven has to follow the Catholic priest? If the Catholic priest tells you you are forgiven, there's no wondering, am I forgiven? Maybe I'm forgiven. I hope I'm forgiven. You are guaranteed forgiveness or Jesus is a liar. Don't fall for that. You got to have the confessional. Jesus set it up that way. The book of James tells us this. Matthew 16, 18, uh, 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23 tells us this. You got to go to confession. That's the way Jesus said, once you're declared clean, there's no wondering, maybe I'm declared clean. I hope Jesus did not say, that you don't have to go to the priest. He said, you've got to go to the priest. And so the priest declares you clean. That cleanses your soul of the first big stain, sin. All right? Now, what is, are all sins forgivable? Are all sins forgivable? What's the only unforgivable sin? Sin against the Holy Spirit, right? Guess what, everybody? The second you step in that confessional, you cannot be guilty of the unforgivable sin before you even say a word. You know why? Because the only unforgivable sin is not A, asking for God's mercy. That's the only unforgivable sin. The only unforgivable sin of all is not asking for the mercy of God. And when you walk into that confessional, wherever they are here, over here, over here. Once you walk into that confessional, you cannot be guilty of the unforgivable sin because you are going in to ask for God's mercy. Imperative, all right? So this is very powerful. So the priest, who had ultimate authority to forgive sins on earth? Jesus. And when you have ultimate authority, you have the authority to delegate that authority. And Jesus delegated it to his priests. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. So if the priest tells you, I forgive you, you're forgiven. You don't have that guarantee any other way. You might think, oh, all I have to do is tell Jesus I'm forgiven. You don't know that. People think they can be forgiven, and they're really not. When the priest says you are, then you are. Like, I've had to withhold absolution before. A young man came into the confession. He wasn't real young. He was probably in his late 20s. And he confessed his sin. And I said, are, are you sorry? Because he didn't appear that he was sorry. And he said, well, yeah, Father. Problem is, who are we joking? I'm just going to go right out and commit it again. And I said, well, do you, are you sorry for that? He said, well, honestly, I enjoy it. Yeah, our concupiscence, we enjoy sin. That's our brokenness. But it doesn't mean you have to enjoy offending God. And so I said, well, do you, you know, are you, are you here then? Because you're truly sorry? He says, no, I'm really here just because, you know, I was told I had to come. I said, really? He said, yeah, by my mom. He says, I don't want to be here. I'm not going to change. I can't change. I don't want to give this up. I can't give him absolution. Now, if he thinks that all he had to do was say the same thing to God that he did to me, he wouldn't have received forgiveness from God. You have to be sorry. You have to have some form of contrition. You know, it's funny because God is so merciful. There was a saint, and I can never remember who said this. And there was a guy in the confessional, and the saint, maybe it was John Vianney, and the saint said to the guy, the confessing, are you, know, are you sorry for these sins? And he said, no, the same reason this young guy did to me. 
And the priest was real perplexed. And he says, aren't you sorry that you're hurting God? He's like, he's, or um, that you're committing these sins? He's like, no, I enjoy them too much. He says, all right, my last shot. Are you at least sorry that you're not sorry? He says, oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so God is so much ready to forgive us. We just got to have this much of contrition. And God will forgive us. The very fact that you walk into the confessional is usually enough. And so please get to a confession that wipes away the first stain. That's the stain of sin. All right, now, what's the other stain? The punishment. When we come out of the confessional, we may not have been forgiven of the punishment. We're forgiven of the sin. But sometimes the punishment remains. Now, the eternal punishment, a.k.a. hell, that's gone. As soon as you walk out of confession, you no longer, unless you sin mortally again, and you die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin, you cannot go to hell. Once you confess, and you do not commit mortal sin again, and, 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 and you don't die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin, you, you won't go to hell. But here's the thing, everybody. If you go, and you come out of that confessional, you still may have temporal punishment remaining for sin. You got to pay for that. You know, a lot of people talk about purgatory. Oh, well, purgatory doesn't exist. That would mean Jesus' work wasn't complete. Uh-uh. Purgatory is not for the forgiveness of sins. Purgatory is to detach. Okay, I can confess alcoholism or gluttony or pornography. If I confess that, then I'm forgiven. But I may still be attached to alcohol. I mean, I'm not, I don't drink, but <laughs> you see my point. Purgatory is to detach from those things. And so it's not for the forgiveness of sins. You're not forgiven in purgatory. If you're not forgiven on this earth, you can't be forgiven after you die. And so we have this sometimes atonement for our sins, and that's what purgatory is. It detaches us. So that second stain is punishment that we are owed. If we then go to confession, we're forgiven of our sins, we also have to get rid of that punishment. Now, there's only a couple ways to get rid of that punishment. One's a plenary indulgence. Anybody here ever hear of plenary indulgences? But with them, you can have no attachment to sin. Good luck with that. That's not easy. You can have no attachment to sin. That means if I have the sin of gluttony, and I, I, I eat too much. I can be forgiven of that sin, but if I still have that attachment, I want to eat, eat, eat. I'm not pure. I still have stain. But a plenary indulgence is one way to get rid of sin and punishment, but you can have no attachment to sin. That's really hard. So what, how does God give us another way out? All right, this is powerful because on the eighth day when we enter into eternity, as I said, God wants us spotless and he gives us one way to become spotless. So on that eighth day when he comes for us, we're clean. And the next slide is that next way. The feast of divine mercy. Jesus tells us on that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. Now listen up. If you hear nothing else today, this is the extraordinary promise. The soul that will go to confession. Now, does confession have to be on Divine Mercy Sunday? No, it can be before, as long as you're in a state of grace. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. The only two stains on your soul are sin and punishment. If you go to confession and communion, guess what, everybody? Your soul is cleansed, clean, spotless, so that on that eighth day, which is Divine Mercy Sunday, the Feast of Divine Mercy Sunday, when you go to confession and receive Holy Communion, your soul is spotless, not only of the sin, which could be forgiven in the confessional, but all the punishment too, which is not forgiven in the confessional. 
When you do that, you are cleansed, spotless, so that when Jesus comes for you on the eighth day, Divine Mercy Sunday, you can go to heaven. That's why John Paul, I believe, died on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. And it was Divine Mercy Sunday in Australia when John Paul II died. It was Divine Mercy Sunday. And so I believe he received these graces. So remember, everybody, next Divine Mercy Sunday, next year, please go to confession, receive Holy Communion, and ask for this grace. Jesus, please help give me this grace. And so this is the incredible gift. It's, it's not a magic wand. It's just going back to the sacraments. Now, I know I'm way over time there. Oh, my goodness. Let's finish up. Let's finish up. I could do the rest of them in five minutes. <laughs> I know you're all laughing at me, but I can. F we just did was the feast. I is the image. N is the novena. C is the chaplain. H is the hour of mercy. Let's go through this real quick. Next slide. This is the image of divine mercy. All right. Jesus appeared to St. Faustina. This is what he looked like. He had a painting pictured, painted. St. Faustina had a painting done of, of Jesus, how he appeared to her. All right. This, this painting has it all. The, the Holy Father said the, the best images in art of our faith are the ones that capture the Paschal mystery. The entire Paschal mystery is in this image. What's the Paschal mystery? The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It started on Holy Thursday. That's when the Paschal mystery began. What was Holy Thursday? Jesus had the Last Supper. What happened at the Last Supper? Jesus instituted the priesthood. How's Jesus dressed here? As the new high priest. Jesus is the high priest. In his attirement is a Catholic priest. He's wearing what we call an alb. Jesus then, at the last upper room in the Last Supper, instituted the Eucharist. What do we see there? The red, the blushes blood, the Eucharist. Christ established the, the, the Eucharist in Holy Thursday. What's the next day in the Paschal Mystery? Good Friday. Good Friday is the crucifixion. What do we see in the image? You can't see it real well there. The wounds of the crucifixion in the hands and the feet. Next, what happened? The resurrection. Where do we see the resurrection in this image? Christ is in his glorified state. Notice the halo around his head. He has the halo around his head. He is glorified. This is the resurrection. What happened 40 days after the resurrection? Ascension. The ascension. Now, how do we see the ascension in this? <clears throat> it's a little tricky. The Bible tells us before Jesus ascended to the Father, he blessed the people. The Jewish traditional blessing is your right hand raised at shoulder height. Jesus is doing that. Every time you come before the image, you're receiving a blessing. This is the ascension. Finally, what do we celebrate tomorrow? Pentecost. Pentecost is in this image. Why? Because in this image, we have the blood and the water. Pentecost was born of the Holy Spirit. The blood and the water that you see there is the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was born the birth of the church. And the church was born through blood and water. That is the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is in this image. Now notice his left foot. It's stepping forward because this is Jesus coming to you in his last ditch effort to save you before the end of time. And this is awesome. Now I want to finish with this because the red, the rays of red and white are awesome. Why? Because Satan only has two tools, sin. And what's the result of sin? Death. Satan has only two tools, sin and death. What wipes out sin? The cleansing water of confession and baptism. That's why you have the pale ray, water. Blood and water. Water wipes away, cleanses away sin and punishment. Baptism and confession. The next ray is red. What is that? The blood. Okay, what is Satan's other great tool? Death. What wipes out death? Life. And what was life to the Jews? Blood. Blood gives you life. If you don't have blood, you don't live. That is how we have it in the image. All right, so this is just absolutely amazing. No other devotion has this. This is, this is not just our devotion to God, but God's devotion to us. It offers a ton of protection. Uh, all right, let's go to our next slide. It doesn't matter which image you have. They all have grace. The first one I showed is the Vilnius, the original image, but all these images have grace. Let's go on to the Novena. N is the Novena. What's a Novena? Nine days of prayer, symbolizing Mary in the upper room with the apostles, and nine also represents the nine months Jesus was in Mary's womb. So nine represents the before the giving of birth. 
And so the novena, what makes it unique, it's the only novena in our church that's not our intentions. Like we pray novena to St. Anthony if we lose something or St. Peregrine if we have cancer. This is the novena that we pray for God's intentions. He tells us who to pray for. All right, next. C, the chaplet, the chaplet of divine mercy. Very powerful. It's a great intercessory prayer. Jesus makes many promises through it. Let's go to our next slide. Jesus said, priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Are you kidding me? Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet even once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to these souls who trust in my mercy. And let's go to the next slide. We only have a couple left. The hour of mercy. Now, a lot of people know me from Michigan. That M does not stand for Michigan. <laughs> it stands for Mary. And, um, and this is the last of the, of the, of the Finch, F-I-N-C-H, Feast, Image, Novena, Chaplet, Hour. And you know what? I'm sorry. Before I jump into Hour, I should mention one thing about the, the chaplet. You know, the chaplet is so powerful that people ask us all the time, Father, if I miss Mass, what's the next best thing to do? Well, the Mass is divided into how many parts? The Liturgy of the? And Liturgy of the? Eucharist. Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist. If you miss Mass... If it's a Sunday Mass, the next best thing, go to confession. If you miss a weekday Mass, pray the rosary. It's like the liturgy of the word. What's the liturgy of the word? Meditation on scripture. What's the rosary? It's not a bunch of Hail Marys. You're meditating on the mysteries of scripture. The scourging at the pillar. The resurrection. The uh, ascension. Uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The baptism of our Lord. They're all, they're all scriptural. So if you miss Mass, pray the Rosary. It's like Liturgy of the Word. And pray the Chaplet because it's like Liturgy of the Eucharist. What's the Liturgy of the Eucharist? Sacrifice. The priest offers sacrifice. Now, people write to us all the time and say, Father, I can't pray this prayer. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. I'm not a priest. Only the priest can offer that. But by virtue of your baptism... You share in the offices of priest, prophet, and king. You are a priest, a prophet, and a king. And by priest, you offer sacrifice. So when you pray the chaplet, you're offering sacrifice. Amazing. All right, to finish, the hour of mercy, three o'clock every day, Jesus said at that time to meditate on my passion. The reason we pray the chaplet at three o'clock is because it's about his passion. Jesus didn't say you have to pray the chaplet. You could walk the stations of the cross about his passion or pray the chaplet because it's for the sake of his sorrowful passion and so this is amazing and so do this and then meditate on his passion and you receive many graces just like if you pray the rosary like the liturgy of the word pray the chaplet like liturgy of the eucharist and then make a spiritual communion lord please come into me i can't receive you sacramentally but give me the grace as if i did you are blessed and so this one here, um, this is so much powerful. So to wrap up, to summarize the last slide, couple slides, I am giving mankind the last hope of salvation that is recourse to my mercy. The last hope of your salvation. What is the last hope of salvation? What is recourse to his mercy? ABC and Finch. ABC and Finch is recourse to his mercy. John Paul II said there's nothing mankind needs more than divine mercy. He consecrated the world to divine mercy. Pope Benedict said divine mercy is not some secondary devotion, but an integral part of Christian life and prayer. Even Pope Francis said he declared the year of mercy. He said the mercy of God is infinite, but the time of mercy is not. He said we have very little time left. And he declared the year of mercy. All right, so then our next slide. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the my mercy we see that today um faustina is preparing the world you know john paul ii when he canonized saint faustina and gave us the feast of divine mercy said this is the happiest day of my life he said the reason he was made pope john paul of all the things he did was to canonize saint faustina and give us the feast of divine mercy and he died on divine mercy sunday and so the the last one and then we have a quick video of only one minute this is why Jesus said, I have all eternity for punishing. 
So I'm prolonging the time of mercy for the sake of sinners. But woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. You know what, everybody? You don't have to worry about this. Because you wouldn't be here. If you, didn't, if you were to not recognize the time of his visitation, the very fact that you are here, you don't, you don't fall into that category. Stay on this path. Don't leave it. And so we have a one minute video and then we're done. Can we play that last video? This is a it good It was summer. to this novice, considered no one special by her superior, that Jesus Christ would quietly entrust a great mission. Christ instructed Faustina to remind the world about God's unfathomable mercy. She was to accomplish this by introducing new devotional practices to honor mercy and by establishing a worldwide movement of souls dedicated to spreading divine mercy. Jesus directed Faustina to proclaim to the world that even the worst and most hopeless sinner was deserving of God's infinite mercy. It is divine mercy, he said, that will determine the future destiny of the world. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times after it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fount of my mercy. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, everybody. Thank you so, so much. We're very grateful that you could all come. Now we're going to finish because you know there's a plenary indulgence for coming to a retreat and a conference on divine mercy. And so uh, in this, we pray an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And if we continue, please, to pass, because we want everybody to be able to get out to lunch here pretty quick. So if we can continue to pass on that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I guess we only got about one minute before it finishes to the back. As we wrap up this one minute, any questions? I know this is so much to throw at you, but yes, we have a question. Okay, it doesn't trump Easter. The priest is correct. The question was, does it trump Easter? No, it doesn't. They are the same feast. They're part of what's called an octave, an octave of eight days that is called the Easter octave, bookend by Easter Sunday and Divine Mercy Sunday. And by the way, it's not optional. The priest is to celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. Okay, yes, next question real quick. We'll just do a couple. Punishment on future generations. You know where it's okay. So the question is Does divine mercy, the grace of wiping out all sin and punishment, apply to the future? No, it's not a magic wand. It's only from that point backwards in your life. No, it's not. It's, and it's, it's not for anybody else but yourself. The grace of divine mercy Sunday is only for yourself. It's not even for a holy soul. And it's called the extraordinary promise. Now there is a plenary indulgence on Divine Mercy Sunday, but that's separate. That you can offer for a holy soul. But no, it's not for future generations. 
and it's not for yourself for the future. It's from that point backwards. So get back to Divine Mercy every year to get a yearly cleansing, okay, and clean up. Okay, let's do one more. Yes. Yes. So the question was real quick, have the Marian fathers, it was uh, talk that we were canceled. Yes, we had some videos removed and there was talk that we were going to be canceled, like LifeSite has been canceled off of YouTube. So we created a new platform called Divine Mercy Plus. So D-I-V-I-N-E-M-E-R-C-Y-P-L-U-S, spelled out, dot org. And we have all of our videos up there. All of our work is up there. Everything is up there. So if YouTube cancels us, please go to Divine Mercy Plus. Even with YouTube, it's a better way to find all our talks and all our videos. Okay, real quick, one more. Ah, how many indulgences can you get in one day? Plenary, you can get one. Because plenary wipes away all sin and punishment. Partial, which wipes away partial sin and punishment, you can do as many as you want. You know how many, do you know what a partial indulgence is? Do you know how you can get them? Sign of the cross is a partial indulgence. Busting yourself with holy water is a partial indulgence. These are easy to get. You should be doing them all day long. They're very, very good. Okay, thank you everybody and God bless you. Thank you.